Dr. Michelle Farrer. Michelle is a paediatric neurologist at the Sydney Children's Hospital and 2016 MNDRIA Beryl Bailey Postdoctoral Fellow. The Sydney Children's Hospital is a study site for spinal muscular atrophy clinical trials and Michelle is endeavouring to develop therapies in children and young people with motor neurone diseases. Michelle is featured in the 25 report for, her, for contributing to the development of Nusen Nursen, a world first emerging treatment for SMA. I personally find her work really quite phenomenal and providing, it, it provides a message of hope for us all. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. So for many people with motor neuron disease, participating in a clinical trial may be the only way to access potential treatments. And my Beryl Bailey Fellowship aims to develop clinical trial capacity for children and young people with motor neuron disease and put that within the clinical context of translation. And um, today I was asked to talk about my clinical trial experience, the opportunities, the challenges from my personal perspective. So um, as a paediatric neurologist, I've made countless diagnoses of children with motor neuron disease. And I have vivid memories of informing desperate parents that there's nothing that could be done to save their child's life. But recently, last week, two innovative therapies were published that have brought some hope to children with motor neuron disease. And in fact, at the time that Aviana's family made national headlines, she was the ninth person in the world to access these therapies outside of a clinical trial. And just last Friday, one drug became the first and only approved therapy for SMA in Australia. But what does that mean? for our patients and our families. So this is one of my patients, and what is SMA? It is a motor neuron disease. It's characterised by loss of the motor neurons in the spinal cord. But unlike other forms of motor neuron disease, the brain appears to be relatively preserved. And you can see that this little baby has typical features, but at a much younger age, he's got the paradoxical breathing, profound floppiness, he's bright and alert, his brain's completely normal but he's paralysed. So spinal muscular atrophy is in fact the leading genetic cause of infant death, has an incidence of one in 10,000 births, which actually means that it's the most common genetic cause of motor neuron disease. And for patients like this one featured, the average life expectancy would be nine months. And unfortunately, type one, which is the severest type, is also the most common type of SMA. Um, so SMA is a monogenic form of motor neuron disease, unlike what we've heard earlier today, um, being um, epigenic and many other factors. Um, and certainly it provides a strategy and a, a really good example of how understanding the genetic underpinnings and the pathophysiology pathophysi provides a pathway to therapy. And so SMA is caused by homozygous disruption of the SMN1 gene and all SMA is caused by deficiency of the survival motor neuron protein. But in fact, there is an almost identical gene right next door called the survival motor neuron 2 gene, which also codes for the same protein. And in fact, one of the only, one of 10 nucleose changes between the two genes is a C to T transition in exon 7. It doesn't change the code of the protein, but it changes the way the splicing is recognised so that the majority of the SMN2 transcripts do not include exon 7 and exon 8, so the protein is rapidly degraded. So in terms of therapeutic strategies, it really provided a pathway to go forward. Um, and one of the pathways was to block that splicing element of silencing so it's no longer recognised. So the SMN2 transcripts could actually make the protein it would be stable and functional, or alternatively, to do gene replacement therapy. So SMA does have a um, spectrum of severity, and in fact, the best and only known modifier is the number of copies of SMN2, which varies between individuals. And really, 
um, individuals can be have between one copy of SMN2 right up to eight copies of SMN2. And if you have SMA, really it cor the severity inversely correlates with the number of copies of SMN2 you have. So we can, to some extent, if you identify it, genetically you could predict what type of SMA you have. Um, and so with understanding these genetic um, underpinnings, this is what the therapeutic pipeline looks like today in terms of approaches, and these incorporate the molecular genetic approaches as well as neurogenetic, um, neuroprotective approaches and also therapeutic approaches to increase muscle strength. So lots is happening. Um, and so the one that has just been approved, Nusi Nursen, it really has been the most whirlwind experience. So the first patient was dosed in late 2011. And this was a drug that came from a research lab, was painted in, in a research lab and then collaborated with industry um, to take it forward. And so the phase one and phase two trials were encouraging. So then the phase three study embarked and um, I'm one of the principal investigators leading an Australia site in that clinical trial. And in fact, you can see that it's called the INDEER study. The first patient in this phase three trial was dosed in late 2014. We dosed the first Australian patient in mid 2015. And really, it was trial by social media because really what happened was there was, it was very obvious. I was blinded, but I could guess what my, what my patients were on because the effect was so remarkable. Well, you know, you were seeing children acquire skills that you never saw. So, I mean, the social media was really calling for... <laughs> The unmet need, and these are the sorts of things an untreated child compared to a child on treatment that was, and there was a lot of pressure to stop the study, do an early analysis, but that could have actually compromised the results if the primary endpoint wasn't met. Um, and again, other things um, in milder children, this was a child with type 2, children with type 2 never walk. And this was the other, um, you know, children with milder types of SMA. This was the stuff that was on social media talking about the effect. But really, is this an outlier? Is this really what is representative of all patients? So what happened was, if you look at the trial, um, the pre-specified interim analysis was, set, um, was waited for. And when um, 80 patients met day 90 or whatever it was in the trial, an interim analysis was done and it met endpoint and the study stopped. And that happened in August last year. So when you look at the timeline, it was a whirlwind. And really three months later, the, F the T FDA approved the drug. And then, you know, nine months after, um, 10 months after that, Australia approved the drug. And so it has been very fast and we're still catching our breath about that. Um, so, Really, what is Nusi Nursen? It's an antisense oligonucleotide and it increases the full length SMN2 mRNA. And this is, um, was published last week in the New England Journal of Medicine and it was a clinical trial we were involved with. And the top um, panel really illustrates the primary endpoint, which was event-free survival. And so not all patients finished the study. So the data is different and patients are at different times in the study. They all haven't reached the same point, which was 15 months. Um, and you can see that there is a significant difference in survival in the treated group, which was um, only 39% 30, of ch um, children that were treated with Nusi Nursen died or required permanent ventilation. In contrast, 30% of children in the sham arm were alive at the end of the study. So that was a very significant difference and I think that's really what um, led to the approval. In overall survival and, you know, the treatment varies, but um, in other parts of the world, children are ventilated and you can see that um, there is, a, again, a significant difference compared to control. And in fact, in the new, someone asked me, what is the average survival of an infant on Nusi Nursen? And, and the, we don't know because they're all still alive and we actually are not yet able to calculate a median survival in this cohort of patients. If you look at 
Beyond survival, secondary endpoints were motor response and 51% of the treated group had motor milestone response and that was um, just a developmental um, tool that we used at the time. And in fact, at the final analysis, 8% of children had stable sitting, which no child with SMA type 1 would ever achieve without treatment, and 1% of children were standing. So it's not a cure in symptomatic patients and we need to do better. And really, the important and take-home message is that the best results were seen in those who started treatment within 13 weeks of symptom onset. The unknown is, do we need lifelong treatment? And it is now one of the most expensive drugs in the world. And the current listed price in the US is $125,000 per dose. And you need seven treatments in the first year and then three thereafter. So I will expand on that a little bit more. But at the same time, in fact, the lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine that week was a second innovative promising therapy, single dose intravenous gene therapy for SMA. This was a phase one study of 15 patients in a single centre. There were two cohorts, a low dose cohort and a high dose cohort. And you can see that all patients are still were alive at the last um, assessment. So, in fact, if you look at the age of 20 months, 8% of untreated children with SMA would be alive, whereas all 15 children were alive at this time. So, again, a very promising drug. But also what was found is that regardless of dosing and baseline motor, motor function, 9 of the 12 children in the high-dose cohort were able to sit unassisted. That's remarkable and I think that's really promising and two of them could crawl and stand but again the same message came through through this clinical trial. The degree of treatment outcomes appeared to be influenced by age of dosing and the baseline motor function. So the Nurture study is really the one that really brings home this message and this is a phase two open label study of 20 pre-symptomatic infants with SMA who began Nusi Nursen before onset of symptoms. They were largely identified because they had affected siblings and they were um, tested at birth. And the grey line at the bottom is the sham natural history or of motor milestones. The blue is the phase two Nusi Nursen symptomatic patients, um, the phase three, and the red's the phase two Nusi Nursen. The top line is the pre-symptomatic. So it really is a no-brainer. The earlier you treat, the better you do. And really, it could. Um, what it's saying is that 11 of 12 children in the pre-symptomatically pre um, were sitting when they should be sitting, and 64% of children were cruising or walking at the time that they should be achieving these. And again, the number of copies of SMN2 was a predictor of response because this is an SMN2 targeted therapy. And this child here is one of the Australian children enrolled in this trial. And he's one and he looks completely normal and really was achieving exactly what he should be and looking at him and comparing him to his affected sibling worlds apart. So the... Um, the trial was stopped and what happened was that an expanded access or compassionate program was launched and Aviana was one of the first patients that began this and it was really to provide access to patients with the greatest need while regulatory approval and reimbursement was sought. Um, but really I was involved in setting this up for Australian patients and it really was something that crossed clinical care, research and hospital executives. So you think about your research, you go to an ethics committee. I had to go to the clinical governance committee, the hospital executive, the research committee, the drug committee, the TGA. So it was something I'd never experienced before and it crossed so many segments of healthcare. Um, took, and fortunately, they were very supportive of it and we were able to achieve it quickly. And so Aviana's growing up and she has reached her first birthday, defying the first headline of the Sydney Morning Herald. So there are many challenges together and many innovative, um, many challenges we face with these innovative therapies. And now prognosis and life expectancy is uncertain in the patients being treated with these new agents. 
And the editorial that accompanied the two New England Journal articles was that treatment with Nusi Nursen now brings new responsibilities. We're consenting patients to participate in these programs and negotiating limited data. We don't know what the long-term effects will be and what the long-term outcomes will be. There's limited alternative therapies, so how do parents choose to do this or not? There's also limited hospital resources. And really, I think, in the US, because the approval was so quick, each centre had 100 patients wanting to be treated at the same time. Hospital admin is saying, well, we can't help you. You'll have to do this and you'll have to prioritise patients and work out how to do this. Who's going to qualify? Who's going to wait? We've actually been asked that ourselves, but um, it's not approved for type 2 or type 3 patients yet, but how on earth are we going to make these decisions? And also, what is new optimal care now that there is a new natural or unnatural history evolving? And as the Sydney Morning Herald editorial said, hard choices for parents and hard choices for society. So my experience in setting up the expanded access program is that in Australia, um, when I put this slide together, there were 16 patients. And looking at when they started to develop symptoms, it was a median of four months of life. They were diagnosed at nine months. They'd had a disease duration on average of 4.2 months. What had happened in those four months when, you know, you'd think if your child was sick, you'd see a doctor. They did. It wasn't picked up. They'd seen nurses. They'd seen paediatricians, midwives, lactation consultants. So really, it's been about building SMA awareness. Nobody's heard of this disease. Why would you? The children were never in society. They weren't surviving. But it's very important now. And also, some of these um, had family history. Some of them had gone through IVF been to their GP and said, we want to have a healthy baby, can you help us? They were never offered screening. The carry frequency is one in 40. It's actually quite common. This is one of my patients who is treated, and it really does bring home to me disease onset. At two months, look at him. He's got great heat control. He can lift his body up on his forearms. At four months again, he's looking pretty good. But what happened between four and five months? Something happened. And I would say we have opportunities to pick this up early before the horse bolts. So there is now a neurological urgency to diagnose SMA. And really, we need to now be thinking about strategies to diagnose this before the horse bolts. And that really brings the question as to whether newborn screening should be undertaken. This could be picked up by newborn screening. And it really is now meeting all the World Health Organisation criteria for a screening test and should, I think this discussion needs to start happening. So there are issues, ethical issues, we don't, know. we can modify disease severity but it is not a complete cure, particularly in symptomatic patients and I think my patients do struggle. Would a short life with a quality of life be better than treating and having a chronic disease that goes for many years with uncertain outcomes? I don't know the answer to this, this is what they tell me. There are also many other uncertainties. We don't know with an intrathecal, which is by lumbar puncture treatment, it's only going to the spinal neurons. It's not going to other parts of the body. How is it going to affect broader aspects of the phenotype? What will be the age of death? What will be the need for permanent ventilation? Not all patients have the same response. Can we predict that at the start? Is there a biomarker? And really, we don't yet have a full appreciation of the full therapeutic benefits. So we are now involved in the international open label study, looking at the long-term benefits or long-term impact. This is one of my patients who's about to turn three, who was treated with new Hello. And Hello. I would have to say Hi. this is the impression Hi. of most of the investigators and the um, phase two studies is we have not yet seen a plateau. There are ongoing improvements. So I think the initial data, while 7% are sitting, is disappointing. I think that really reflects the fact that not everybody was at the same age and on the same length of duration of treatment. And I think there's more to come. But with these uncertainties, there's also many research opportunities. And I think the support of MNDRIA in building my team and expertise amongst my colleagues really means that we are poised to answer some of these opportunities, to look at the long-term impact, to look at how nerves respond to therapy with novel techniques like nerve excitability, to understand these changes. In fact, we know the molecular therapeutic basis, but we don't know the pathophysiology of how this is affecting the nerve. And we really feel that we, I mean, we're active in our studies to understand this and take this forward. And it is now a new phenotype. 
we, it's not what we've ever seen before. And so children, um, I think this really illustrates the organisation of motor neurons within the spinal cord. So the ones that are lateral go to the muscles of the extremity. The ones that are ventral go to the muscles of the trunk and the spine. If you think of an intrathecal therapy, it will be going and perfusing, and it's more likely to go to the lateral muscles of the spine. Um, lateral motor neurons. So the new phenotype might well be that they're moving, but they can't breathe. So we don't know yet, but these are some of my concerns. And also, we need to really define the new natural history. And this is what the previous natural history was. It was a developmental disorder. They gained skills and then they plateaued. Is it that it's been so significant because we've really studied children at the developmental phase where they're gaining skills, so we've overpowered the study and it's going to change? Or are they going to continue with normal development or are we just stretching out the x-axis of disease course in SMA and we are still to see a plateau phase? We don't know. So in the clinic, it really the consensus statement for standard of care in SMA was published in 2007 and at the time the treatment for SMA type 1 was palliative care. Clearly we can't apply that now. We are in a time where the effect is uncertain and we don't know what the prognosis will be, but we have to evolve and change what our standard of care is. Um, so this is the x-ray of one of my patients and it really, he's now eight months old and you can see we are really challenged. How do we prioritise nutrition, gastro, like he already has a gastrostomy, we've put that in. He's had heart surgery, because uh, he had a co-opt of the aorta and SMA, the motor neuron also, that SMN also infects other organi organs and severe SMA is known to affect the heart. He also has a marked scoliosis. Should we be intervening with that? Should we be monitoring hips? What do we do for his chest? What do we do for his nutrition? What level of therapy do we do? They're having frequent hospitalizations because of respiratory illnesses and we also need to do therapy to get them moving, in case, you know, anticipating ongoing improvement and not letting contractures get in the way of motor function and benefiting from these therapies. So we're really needing to prioritise our resources and um, negotiating access with NDIS and trying to find therapists with experience that are NDIS funded. All challenges that we're now facing and it's also difficult to predict the outcomes and anticipate when the equipment is needed and prescribe it and also managing parental anxiety and also managing their hope. So there are many resource implications and ethical issues. Um, the supply and demand, which I alluded to before, who will be treated, who will wait. We're waiting to see if this will be reimbursed in Australia. And there are limited hospital resources and how are we going to cope if this is something that does merge into clinical practice, which it already is. I mean, these kids need lots of lumbar punctures and we're just bringing, we're just taking this on with what we already do. But if this is a new therapy and a new service, it should be funded as such. And then we have lots of patients with chronic SMA that have spinal surgery and fusions. We need to access their backs as too if they want, if they want to access therapy. And in fact, this boy it has SMA type 1, is 14 and he's having therapy, and we are getting access through CT guidance to give his intrathecal therapy. So currently, only SMA type 1 patients in Australia are eligible for treatment with Nusi Nursen, and so really it's uncertain as to what other patients are going to do in terms of getting access to this promising therapy. It, the cost is certainly prohibitive, and I think this is already debated amongst um, many places and the Lancet Neurology has called for a debate about fair drug prices. Biogen has said that the pricing in, is in line with its clinical benefit and the prices of other orphan drugs. I'm not going to say too much, I'm just telling you, it's a black box of pricing to me. So to summarise, where will we stand? We're in an era with innovative therapies providing hope. Early diagnosis is critical and I urge you all to consider the need for newborn screening. We are able to apply precision medicine and it's a model for other forms of rare diseases and motor neuron disease and it's an opportunity for innovative research. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge these people.
it would be about $7 per patient. There's 100,000 children born in New South Wales per year. That would be $700,000, which would be one year of treatment. Um, the thing is, it's a genetic test. Newborn screening is currently biochemical, so the lab would need to um, have in place the strategy to undertake that, and they do, OK, in this state. There's been a pilot study in severe combined immunodeficiency, and the lab's able to do the work. Now, you can act, it's a multiplex, so you can add other diseases on. So the reason I'm saying that is it's incremental. So if you're already screening for another genetic disease using this technology, the cost reduces. So you can add SMA testing to newborn screening for five cents on top of another genetic disease. So there has been a dialogue in this country about screening for severe combined immunodeficiency. And um, I think if you combine tests, you get more bang for your buck. So there's no clinical trial data on that population in the US. There are a number of um, patients that are being treated and they um, do say to me that the, the need is to maintain function. They do slowly lose function over time and it is critical that they maintain anything they have and that provides a huge quality of life and I'm in support of that philosophy. I think the science does not answer that question as to whether it would work. Um, I would think that is important and I hope if it is approved that we can undertake collaborative studies to answer those questions. Um, and really, I think the PBAC, um, yeah, I probably shouldn't comment, but I mean, how do you value these treatments? And I think these are the important questions we all face. I mean, as a clinician, I'd love to treat all my patients. <laughs> So, so for the issues of sort of chronic treatment and what's ahead of you, has, has animal models given you any information as to what the chronic treatment with this sort of drug will do? So I was talking to Brad Turner over morning tea about this. I'm not aware of an animal model of SMA treated with Nusi Nursen. Um, maybe it's been done but not published. I'm being a bit cynical here. But um, certainly it's been done with the gene therapy. But the thing with the gene therapy is it's a single dose, so you don't need repetitive therapy. Um, so I think it's an important question, and the study that needs to be done is stopping Spinraza or Nusi Nursen in an animal model to look at the duration of effect beyond the developmental stage. And I think we need the data scientifically to answer that. I think the take-home message is that this is interdisciplinary and to get from the bench to bed bedside, we need to think of all aspects and we need to now go back to the bench. There has been a lot of front or second page articles on preconception screening. Um, I think it was page two of the Melbourne Age last week, um, and that was on the back of a study published in Genetics in Medicine from the Melbourne Group, where they um, there are commercial tests for preconception screening in Australia, which means that you pay for them and you opt into them. And one of them is PREPARE, done in Victorian Clinical Genetic Service. It's $350, Fragile X SMA and Cystic Fibrosis. They published their experience with that commercial service, over 12,000 people that opted in. And the carrier frequency of those three diseases was one in 20. What that means is it's more common than Down syndrome, which is screened during pregnancy. Um, now, this is, people are going to start citing Galactica. There's many issues around this that need to be resolved. It's not just financial, medical science, it's ethical, it's social, it's cultural. But um, I think really I, the families I see feel cheated that they have asked and they weren't given that opportunity. So I think the first step is awareness and education about these so that if people choose and want to, they have the options to make reproductive choices. 
Thank you, Michelle.